Yeah. Well, thank you um, for inviting me um, and for also meeting a little bit later uh, than the normal time. Um, so I'm going to speak on um, a joint project with a, a number of people. Um, so Carolina Arujo, Roya Bichetti, Ana Maria Castrovet, uh, Svetlana Makarova, Enrica Mizon, and Navitia Visvanathan. Um, and so um, we have been working for almost two years on these uh, questions around higher Fano manifolds. Um, so today I'm going to speak on the minimal projective bundle dimension and uh, torque to Fano manifolds. And so um, I want to explain, of course, the words in, in this title. And so I'm going to start off with the, the second part, this two fano. Um, and so I want to give you a little bit of motivation um, for these higher fano manifolds. Mm. OK, um, so let me maybe start um, with fano manifolds. So I want to remind you that we have um, a complex projective manifold is fano if the anti-canonical line bundle is ample. Um, or equivalently, if the first turn class uh, is positive. So maybe just as some first uh, examples of a Fano manifold, so uh, projective spaces are going to be Fano. Um, so maybe as another example, uh, if we look at smooth, uh, complete uh, intersections of low degree in projective space, So these are going to be some examples of uh, Fano manifolds um, and also some rational homogeneous spaces are also some examples of, of Fano manifolds. OK, so this um, condition of the, the anti-canonical line bundle being positive or the first turn class being positive um, gives some strict uh, geometric properties of our, our manifold. Um, and so these are uh, classical results um, that I, I want to uh, point out. So the first is um, maybe from Mori in 1979, uh, that any Fano manifold is going to be covered um, by rational curves. Um, and then kind of extending this, uh, so Campana and Kolar, Mayoka and Mori uh, showed that any Fano manifold is going to be rationally connected. And so again, that just means that if we have two points um, in our final manifold, we can find a, a rational curve um, that connects those two points. Okay, so these are some some kind of very properties that that final manifolds have. Um, and so, um, De Jong and Star in about 2006. Um, so they started thinking about. Um, an idea of higher rational connectedness. So they introduced uh, and investigated possible conditions for generalizing these results of, of Mori and Campana, Kolar, Mioka, and Mori um, for what they called higher rational connectedness. Okay, and so to do so, they they put forward um, a definition of what they called k fano, um, and so that is what I want to to look at next. Okay, um, and so let me maybe first just define it for uh, two fano, and then we can define it um, for higher k uh, as well. Um, so they said that a smooth projective variety we're going to call two fano. Um, if first of all it's fano. So the anti-canonical line bundle is positive. And then uh, this second churn character, OK, so that's one half of C1 of the tangent bundle squared minus C2 of the tangent bundle. Um, so if this is positive. And so what we mean by positive is that if you take this second churn character and you intersect it with any surface um, in your, your manifold or your variety, that you get something positive. OK, so we have this. Um, condition here on the second turn character for two fauna. Okay, and now we can do the same thing uh, for um, k bigger than or equal to two. So in particular, it'll be three fauna if it is fauna, and then the third turn character is positive. Mm. 
OK, so they they put forward this definition um, and so maybe a few first uh, observations is that um, our n dimensional projective space. So this is going to be n fauna. So the nth turn character is positive. Um, and it's a conjecture uh, that this is the only n dimensional n fauna manifold so that there's not any other n dimensional um, manifold that has this um, n fauna property. OK, and then they also um, investigated kind of the geometry of these higher Fano manifolds. Um, so in particular, they uh, showed that if we have a two Fano manifold and then some mild assumptions um, that these are going to be covered by rational surfaces. So this is a direct generalization of, of Mori's results that if we have a Fano um, manifold that it's covered by rational curves. OK, and then there are some similar results that hold for for higher manifolds. So for three Fano's plus some um, additional uh, mild assumptions that you'll be covered by rational three folds and, and so on. <clears throat> OK, so we kind of do see that maybe this is a good definition that is kind of generalizing uh, this idea of Fano. OK, um, so the other thing that Dijon and Starr also started to think about is can we um, classify these higher Fano manifolds? Um, so in the case of two Fano, so again, let me just remind you here that this means that uh, X is, is Fano uh, and this second churn character is positive. So for all S and X surfaces. OK, um, in around 2013, uh, so Carolina Araju and Anna Maria Castrovet, uh, they gave a classification of, of two Fano manifolds that have high index. Um, so remember here uh, that the index is uh, the largest uh, integer divisor of minus kx and pick x. OK, so they have a nice classification of all the two Fano manifolds that have um, high index. Um, so in a, a previous work of our group, um, so we gave a classification of homogeneous two Fano manifolds. Um, so we have um, more examples of, of two Fano there. Um, but maybe just just point out that all the known examples of two Fano manifolds are, are special in a sense. So they all have uh, Picard number one. And they all have relatively large index. OK, so um, we'll kind of come back to this, um, the, these ideas of, of two Fano here in a moment. Um, but let me maybe also just mention what happens if, if two is or if K is bigger than two. Um, so there are not very many examples of these higher Fano manifolds known. So three Fano, four Fano, et cetera, other than some projective spaces. Um, so again, we kind of also looked at at some three Fano in some previous work, um, and so maybe let me just just mention a few results um, along those ways. So if our dimension is uh, bigger than or equal to three, um, and again we're going to look at index um, that's bigger than or equal to uh, n minus two. So similar high index like um, Carolina and Anna Maria had for the two Fanos. Um, so we can show here um, that the three Fano, or at least some examples of three Fanos. Um, so Pn, um, and then um, some complete intersections in projective space. And uh, some complete intersections in weighted projective space. OK, so this is not a full classification of all the three Fanos. Um, we were just able to find um, some new examples of, of three Fanos. And one question, you know, we would love to have an answer to is, is can we get any examples that aren't kind of these, you know, basic ones that are complete intersections? OK, so there are some examples of, of three Fanos and two Fanos and, and higher ones, but not too many. And so it's an interesting question to try to find um, some examples of these because there's lots of results now that are being proved about these higher Fanos and we'd like to have some examples. OK, so now I want to switch over into the Torek case uh, is which we're going to focus on um, today. 
Okay, so our assumption um, is going to be that we have a, a, a torque um, manifold. Um, and so maybe the, the first thing to point out is that um, projective um, spaces are going to be the only torque manifolds that have Picard number one. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, um, all examples that we have so far of um, two Fano manifolds um, have Picard number one. And so there would be a question of whether that is always that is always true. Um, and so that's leading us to thinking about a classification of toric two Fano manifolds. Okay, so if we had this nice classification of toric two Fano manifolds, well, either we could find something um, that is two Fano that has a higher Picard number, so something that's not a projective space. Okay, or we may find um, that projective space is the only uh, toric two Fano manifold, and in that case, it might give us some evidence that maybe, in general, it's true that every two Fano manifold has Picard number one. Okay, so when we're looking at um, the toric case, uh, we often can investigate geometric properties by looking at the combinatorics of the associated fan. So you have this nice kind of going back and forth between the variety and, and the fan. Um, and this bridge has, has been used uh, in, in search of some new examples of, of toric two Fano manifolds. Um, so, there is a, a really nice database um, of toric two Fano manifolds uh, through dimension eight. Um, so we have a very explicit, you know, description of these toric uh, Fano manifolds. Um, and so uh, both Nobili and Sano Sato and Tsuyama have worked with these databases um, and they have um, given a classification of uh, toric two Fano manifolds up through dimension eight. And in that case, the only ones that are two Fano are projective spaces. Okay, let me maybe just mention that this is a, a very explicit um, kind of verification. Um, so in each of these cases, so they look at each, all the, the torque Fano manifolds of a given dimension, and they very explicitly uh, construct a surface Um, S that is in their given uh, toric uh, uh, two Fano manifold, um, or sorry, toric uh, Fano manifold, and they show that it is not two Fano by showing that um, this intersection is um, going to be non positive. Okay, so it's a very explicit um, proof. Again, just going through these different cases, since we have up through dimension eight, we have a very nice description of um, all of these Fano, uh, toric Fanos. Hmm. Okay, so that brings us then to the, the conjecture that I want to talk about today. Um, so um, as we've hinted at, um, the, the conjecture um, is that the only toric two Fano manifolds are indeed projective spaces. Okay, so if we have a uh, toric two Fano manifold, it has to be projective space. Okay, um, so how we're going to approach this conjecture um, is we're going to um, try to investigate these two Fano manifolds um, by studying their minimal dominating family of rational curves. Okay, and so this I, um, kind of uh, idea or, or process, this has been exploited so far um, in the non toric case. So this was started with, again, uh, Carolina and Ana Maria, and what we did when we looked at some of these other examples of, of higher Fano manifolds um, is to relate this to this minimal dominating family of rational curves. Okay, and as we'll see here um, in the toric case, we can kind of interpret these uh, minimal dominating families of curves in terms of um, some primitive collections and primitive relations. Okay, all right, so in our, our toric case, um, so we are going to start here um, now for the remainder that we'll start with a smooth and proper toric variety. And whenever we have a toric variety, then we have its corresponding fan, which we'll call uh, sigma sub x. And then um, I'm going to denote here by G 
So this is going to be the set of primitive generators of one dimensional cones um, in my fan. OK, and then we'll also use this G, I guess, um, in with uh, other cones as well. So um, given a cone, let me call Sigma in my fan um, if it's generated by, let me say, uh, Y1 through YK, uh, then we'll denote by uh, G of Sigma. So this is just going to be um, the uh, generators of the one dimensional cones. Hmm. OK, um, so G here is, is simply the set of these, uh, the primitive generators. OK, all right, so um, I want to introduce now um, these primitive collections and primitive relations. So these were uh, introduced by Abatreyev um, and um, have been used to, to study many uh, properties of, of toric varieties. <clears throat> OK, so what is going to be a primitive collection? So it is going to be um, a set again in G. So these are uh, primitive generators of uh, one dimensional cones. And we're going to call it um, a primitive collection if uh, it satisfies kind of two conditions. Um, so first of all, um, they do not form a cone. OK, so they are not a cone um, in our fan. All right, but if I remove um, any one of the Xi, then I do get a cone. OK, so we have something that doesn't form a cone, but by removing any one, we do get a cone. OK, um, so if we have one of these primitive collections, then we're also going to associate with it um, what we're going to call a primitive relation. OK, and so how I'm going to find the primitive relation? Well, I'm going to take all my X's that are in the primitive collection. I'm going to add them together. And then I am going to let Sigma P here be the minimal cone that contains their sum. OK, and then we will get what we call a primitive relation. So uh, the sum of, again, my X1 through XH, and then we have this linear combination where the AIs are positive. So minus uh, A1Y1 uh, through AKYK. So that's what we're going to call um, a primitive collection. So, or sorry, primitive relation. So we have primitive collections, and each of those are going to correspond um, to primitive relations. OK, um, let me maybe give you one fact before we look at some kind of easy examples so that we have a better idea of what these uh, primitive collections and primitive relations are. Um, but one important fact that we're going to be using is that if I have a uh, smooth toric variety of dimension N, um, then I am guaranteed to have uh, at least one primitive relation that has the form that the sum of the X size are simply zero. OK, so uh, we don't have um, this other cone or uh, Ys floating around. OK, so I want to look at maybe two fairly simple examples. Um, so two toric surfaces where we can nicely draw the fan and just to get an idea of what these um, primitive collections and primitive relations are going to look like. OK, um, so the first example I want to look at is uh, projective space. <clears throat> OK, um, and so um, this is the fan here uh, for projective space. It has three one dimensional um, cones, so X0, X1 and X2. And then it has these other two dimensional cones, uh, Sigma 0, Sigma 1 and Sigma 2. OK, and so here with with P2, we have here as a primitive collection. So here, let me note PC by uh, primitive collection. So all three of these uh, one dimensional uh, or primitive generators of one dimensional cones are going to form a primitive collection, right? So they do not all three together um, make up um, a cone in our fan, um, but any two of them uh, will. So uh, X1 and X2 make up sigma zero, which is a cone. Uh, similarly, X0 and X2 form a cone and X0 and X1 form a cone. OK, so this is a, a primitive collection. And then, of course, if we look at the sum of these, uh, we're going to simply get zero. And so here we have kind of one of these special uh, primitive relations where the, where the sum is going to be zero. 
OK, so that's a primitive collection on P2. Let me maybe slightly get a little more complicated, but not too much. Um, so I could look at the Hertzebrück surfaces. Um, and so here R is just a, a positive integer. Um, and so the R here is being used uh, for the generator of what we're calling X3. Okay, um, so let me maybe give you two different primitive collections on this example. Uh, so the first primitive collection we have, we could look at uh, X0 and X2. Okay, so those two together do not form a cone, but individually each one does. So it's a primitive collection here. Um, and notice that X0 plus X2 is just zero. So it's also kind of one of these special um, primitive collections. Okay, uh, slightly more interesting, we could also look at uh, the primitive collection that contains X1 and X3. Okay, so again, those two do not form a cone, but individually they, they both do. Uh, and notice that when we add uh, X1 plus X3, we get uh, RX2. So, um, the sigma p here that we were using in the in the definition of primitive relation. So this is just going to be x2. So the cone generated by x2. And so here we see that x1 plus x3 minus our x2 is zero. Um, so that's the primitive relation um, associated to the primitive collection x1 and x3. Hmm. Okay, so um, we're going to be looking very closely at some of these primitive collections and primitive relations um, moving forward. Um, and so, as I previously mentioned, we wanted to be looking at minimal dominating families of rational curves was our, our strategy for looking, studying these two faunos. Um, and so now I want to relate those minimal families, of, minimal dominating families of rational curves to um, these primitive collections and primitive relations. Okay, and so this is um, following work of Chen, Fu, and Huang. Um, and so they showed exactly this correspondence that I alluded to, um, that minimal dominating families of rational curves on one of our smooth projective toric varieties, uh, these are gonna correspond to a primitive collection and a primitive relation that has this special form where when I add my um, generators of my, uh, or of my, the elements of my primitive collection that we just get zero. Okay, so like we saw um, in the examples of P2 and the Hertzebrück surface, we had some, some primitive collections that had this property. And they called these primitive relations um, centrally symmetric of order M plus one. Hmm. Okay, so these special uh, primitive relations, these centra centrally symmetric uh, primitive relations of order M plus one are gonna be corresponding to these minimal dominating families of rational curves. Um, so we have this, this kind of way of moving back and forth between these two, um, two ideas. <clears throat> okay, um, they also showed uh, this correspondence um, that if we have one of these centrally symmetric primitive collections, of order m plus one, that this is going to correspond to um, an open, dense uh, torus invariant. So here t is my torus um, subset u um, and a pm bundle structure from u uh, to another um, smooth projective uh, toric variety w. OK, so when they looked at uh, this open uh, set, um, for their purposes, they wanted a U that was small. Okay, so a smaller um, a subset. Um, and we would like the opposite. Okay, so what we would really like is we want um, U here uh, as big as possible. OK, so what I'd like to do is explain how we can um, kind of construct this U um, that's going to give us this PM bundle that is going to be um, built out of one of our centrally symmetric primitive uh, collections. OK, so let me maybe kind of go through uh, the idea of how we're going to get this, this PM bundle. 
OK, so we are going to, to start here again um, with a, a primitive collection um, that is centrally symmetric. So remember, this just means here that if we add these all up, we're going to get zero. OK, and remember that since we have a, a primitive collection here, um, that these x0 through xm, they do not form a cone. Um, but if we remove any one of them, they do form a cone. OK, so I want to build up um, an open set based on this uh, centrally symmetric primitive collection. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define this uh, E sub P. Um, so I'm going to look at my cones um, in my fan. And I want to um, look at these particular ones, first of all, that if I look at the generators of my cone, um, they are not any of these X sub I. OK, so my primitive collection and the one dimensional generators of my cone, these are disjoint. OK, and then furthermore, there is a subset of my XIs. OK, such that when I add that subset to um, the generators of sigma, I get a primitive collection. OK, so again, uh, if we add this subset to these uh, generators of sigma, we don't form a cone, but when we remove any one of them, we do form a cone. OK, so we're going to look through all these uh, all the cones um, in my fan. We'll see which ones satisfy this. Um, and then we will define um, this uh, V of EP simply to be the union of the, the V sigmas of the sigmas that live in EP. <clears throat> OK, and so that is going to give us then um, the open set that's going to give us our, our PM bundle. OK, so in X here, we will have this, this U. So again, U is based on one of these centrally symmetric primitive collections. Um, and then this will give us a, a PM bundle structure down to, let's say, W. And W here, this is going to be a smooth uh, torque variety. OK, so again, kind of the key point here is if we have one of these centrally symmetric primitive collections of, of order M plus 1, then we are going to get this PM bundle structure. And this kind of uh, correspondence um, led us to now define this new invariant. So the second term um, in the title of the tuck, um, this minimal projective bundle dimension um, of our toric uh, manifold. Um, and we think this invariant may also be interesting in, in some other contexts as well. Okay, um, so this is the minimal projective bundle dimension of uh, smooth torque uh, variety X, um, or the minimal P dimension for short. OK, and so what we're going to do is we're simply going to look at all the centrally symmetric primitive relations. So primitive relations um, of the form X0 plus XM equals uh, 0. And we are going to look at the minimum um, kind of, of X size that we need here. Okay, so this is what we're going to call our, our minimal projective bundle dimension um, of our toric variety. And notice here that this is going to live between 1 and uh, the dimension of x. Um, and as we mentioned briefly when we, we introduce these uh, primitive collections and primitive relations, we know that we always have at least one primitive collection that has um, this uh, primitive relation for, for some app. Hmm. Okay. So um, we have this new invariant, and so we uh, wanted to kind of get our hands a little dirty and, and kind of see what um, kind of what happens with this with this um, this invariant. Um, and so, as I, I mentioned before, um, with the you know toric uh, manif saddle manifolds of low degree, so or sorry of low dimension, um, we have these databases that we can um, use uh, in order to kind of investigate um, these uh, toric on those. Um, and so we um, looked at not all the way up to dimension eight, uh, but here at least is up through dimension six. 
Um, and so we um, look to see what the minimal projective bundle dimension of each of these uh, toric funnels was. Um, and so here I need to thank Will Reynolds, um, who wrote us some Macaulay 2 code and ran it um, in order to get this uh, information. OK, so let me maybe just um, kind of highlight a few things on uh, this um, table here. So again, we have our dimension of our uh, Fano manifold. Um, this is how many uh, there are. So again, torque Fano manifold. So in dimension four, there are 124 of them. Um, and then if we look at their minimum projective bundle dimension, uh, so 107 of them have a minimum, a minimal projective bundle dimension of one, 15 have um, minimal projective bundle of two, uh, one has three and one has four. Um, and then similarly, uh, 866 in dimension five and 7,622 in dimension six. <clears throat> okay, so let me maybe make a few observations um, from this table here. Uh, so we see a whole bunch of ones here at the end. Okay, and these are our projective spaces. Um, so each of these um, are going to be, so this will be a P4, this is P5, and this one is P6. OK, and that's going to continue. So for any dimension um, of, of X, uh, we will always have simply one um, toric Fano, uh, which is the projective space that is of uh, the maximum minimal projective bundle dimension. OK, um, we also see then a bunch of ones um, kind of in the next spot. Um, and so we will see that this also um, is going, pattern is gonna continue. Um, and so I'll explain how we get those um, in, in a little bit, um, but these are all gonna be blow ups. Uh, they're very particular blow ups. Um, so in particular, this one here is gonna be uh, a blow up um, of P6 uh, along a linear P4. OK, and then maybe one other thing I want to mention um, from this table is if we look here at uh, M equals one, uh, we see that that is really where most, at least in these small dimension, that is where most of our toric funnels are living. OK, so the kind of the majority of our, our toric uh, funnel manifolds are having, at least in this um, in these small dimension, have minimum projective bundle dimension one. OK, so what I want to do again is kind of come back to this question or this conjecture that the only uh, two Fano projective uh, toric uh, manifolds are projective space. Um, and so what we're going to do first is we're going to focus on this case where, again, we see a lot of uh, toric Fano manifolds. We're going to look here at, at the case where um, this minimum projective bundle dimension is one. Um, and then we will switch gears and look at some of these um, higher cases as well, higher dimension or higher uh, M's as well. Okay, so let me maybe focus here um, where this minimum projective bundle dimension is one. And um, again, let me maybe, you know, kind of keeping uh, in what we want to do is we want to show in this case this is not where projective spaces live so we want to show um, that if we have a, a toric Fano that it is not too Fano so here our goal um, is to show that x is not too Fano in this case Okay, and so to do so, we are going to need to find a surface in um, X such that when we intersect it with the second churn character, we get something um, non-positive. So we want to explicitly construct a surface uh, in X uh, with C2 of X that our surface uh, less than or equal to zero. OK, and so that'll then show that we are not too Fano. OK, um, 
So in this case, uh, we have a, uh, again, a primitive collection that's going to have two elements, um, and we know that their sum is zero. Uh, so now, instead of referring that to them as, as x0 and x1, we'll just write them as x and, and minus x. Okay, so we have this uh, given primitive collection. Um, and so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to um, appeal to some results of Cynthia Casagrande. Um, and she very much investigates um, toric uh, faunos that have um, this uh, particular primitive collection. Um, and she constructs um, a birational map uh, from X to Y uh, that has a number of very special properties. Okay, um, so the first property is that um, this X and minus X, when we look at their image in Y, they still uh, are a primitive collection now in Y. So this idea that the primitive collection we started with in X still transfers over to the primitive collection in Y. Okay, um, the second property that this uh, birational map has is that um, this V of uh, EPY, so how we were gonna um, construct this open set, so this has co-dimension greater than or equal to two in Y. Um, and then finally, very explicitly, um, this, this F is constructed, and it is a, a composition of at most two blowdowns um, that have disjoint centers uh, and a smooth target. So here Y is, is smooth. Okay, so what we're gonna now do, as we said, we wanted to construct this surface in X, um, but first what we're gonna do is we're gonna construct now a surface in Y, and then we're going to pull it back to X and hope that everything works out. Okay, so let me maybe explain um, briefly how we're gonna construct, first of all, this, this surface in Y. Okay, um, and so we have this nice picture here. Let me give you um, a few uh, kind of uh, explanations of what's going on um, here in this picture. Uh, so the first thing I have is this U. Okay, so U here is just going to be uh, Y minus this V of uh, EPY. Okay, so again, this now is the U that we showed where we're going to have this P1 bundle structure. So this pi here is, is going to be given uh, by a P1 bundle structure. Mm. Okay, um, and then um, we have this Z here. So Z is simply going to be uh, a closed uh, subset in Y uh, of co-dimension greater than or equal to two. Um, and then I'm gonna take C, so here is C in black. Um, so C is simply gonna be, um, so this will be in uh, U minus C, uh, this is gonna be a very free rational curve. Okay, and now finally, I'm going to construct S here. So to construct S, I'm going to first uh, look down at uh, pi of C, and then we'll take pi inverse of that. So this is gonna be um, in U. <clears throat> and in our picture here, then the S uh, is in red. Okay, so again, very much uh, in order to construct this U, we're using the primitive collection that we started with on X that we're, we're translating to Y. And then we're constructing S um, from there. Okay, so we're gonna construct the surface and then uh, we are going to check. Um, so in fact, we can then show uh, that S uh, intersect the second churn character of uh, Y uh, is going to be zero. Okay, so on this Y, uh, we have um, that uh, S intersect the, the second turn character is zero, and now we want to pull everything back to X. Okay, so let me maybe 
get a repeat here of of my picture. Um, and again, we want to to pull it back to S uh, or pull it back to X and then show that when we take the intersection section with the second turn character, uh, we get something that is non positive. OK, so this is our, our picture here of, of Y um, and then we have. Our X um, again. We're now going to use the properties uh, that Casagrande has with uh, this particular function um, or this birational map here, F. Um, and so uh, we showed here uh, that S with the second turn character of Y is, is zero. Okay, and so now let's let SX uh, be the strict transform. And then we can now relate um, SX, the intersection of SX with the uh, second uh, turn character of X. Okay, so we can show that this is going to be less than or equal uh, to S intersect the second turn character of Y. Okay, so again, very much using um, the properties that we have here um, on of F here to make this all work out. Uh, and as we noted, we can show that this is zero. OK, so in particular, we have constructed this surface um, on X uh, that has the property that the intersection with the second turn character um, is not positive. And so that tells us that X is not going to be too Fano. OK, so it's still very much an explicit um, finding the, the special S that makes everything fail. OK, and very much kind of um, using these these results of Cynthia Casagrande to to get this all to work out. OK, so in the case where our minimal projective bundle dimension is one, um, we do not have um, any possibilities for X to be too Fano. Um, and again, at least looking at kind of the, the data of small dimensions of, of toric Fanos, this is really taking care of a lot of cases. OK, so we then try to kind of move on um, to the minimum projective bundle dimension equal to two um, and uh, became much more complicated at that point. Um, and so uh, we would like this kind of same strategy to work, um, but unfortunately it wasn't. Um, so we kind of put that aside and we wanted to look then at what happens when we have um, uh, kind of high values of um, this minimum projective bundle dimension. OK, um, so at, when we looked at that table, we, we kind of had highlighted a few um, cases. And so let me maybe just tell you why the, that pattern um, continues. Um, so if we look at the maximum minimal projective bundle dimension, so when uh, we have a uh, dimension, um, minimal projective bundle equal to the dimension of our uh, toric variety, um, we only have projective spaces. OK, so that kind of that furthest one that we saw that we mentioned our projective spaces, this is always going to happen. OK, so projective spaces are the only toric manifolds that have one of these centrally symmetric primitive relations of order on the dimension plus one. Mm. OK, when we looked at the table, we also kind of saw this second diagonal of ones. Um, and so this is the case where our minimum projective bundle dim, um, dimension is the dimension of X minus one. Um, and so here we're looking at the work of, of Chen Fu and Wang, who um, we've mentioned before. Um, so they classify uh, torque Fano manifolds that have a centrally symmetric primitive relation of the dimension, order of dimension of X. OK, so they show that there are only three uh, types of varieties that satisfy this, um, but two of them have a centrally symmetric primitive relation of smaller order. OK, so they are not going to have a minimal projective bundle dimension of uh, the dimension of X minus one. OK, so that just leaves us one um, variety left. Um, and so this is the the only n-dimensional toric manifold that has, um, or only 
n dimensional torque Fano manifold that has minimum projective bundle dimension of the dimension of x minus one. So this is exactly that second line of ones that we saw. Um, it's a blow up of Pn along a linear Pn minus two. OK, so in our table, those kind of two diagonals of ones, that's going to continue um, for any dimension of our, our torque Fano's. OK, so let me maybe uh, decrease this by one more. Um, and so we're going to look at um, the minimum projective bundle dimension uh, where it is the dimension of X minus two. <clears throat> OK, um, so Roya Bassetti and Ben Wormlington, um, they investigated torque manifolds that, again, admit one of these centrally symmetric primitive relations of uh, order dimension of X minus one. Um, and so they showed that um, these um, Fano's have Picard number less than or equal to five. And then they also, um, looking at, at their um, kind of uh, classification here, um, we noted that most of the varieties also admit a centrally symmetric primitive relation of order two or three. Okay, so again, these ones here, they will not have um, the desired minimal projective bundle dimension. Okay, and so what we did is we um, kind of improved their bound. Um, and this is probably the most technical, uh, longest part of, of this paper um, that I'm talking about. Um, so if we have a torque Fano manifold uh, that has dimension bigger than or equal to six, um, and the minimum projective bundle dimension is bigger than or equal to three. Okay, so we don't have um, the ones in this case. <clears throat> Okay, and of course we have this um, centrally symmetric primitive relation of order uh, n minus one. Okay, so the first thing we showed is that actually we get a better bound. Um, we have that the um, Picard number is gonna be less than or equal to three. Um, and moreover, um, we don't have any other centrally symmetric primitive relations that have a smaller order. So here um, we do actually have um, the minimum projective bundle dimension is n minus two, and that this um, primitive relation is the only centrally symmetric primitive relation um, of X. Hmm. OK, um, so again, this is a, a fairly technical uh, argument kind of going through different cases of, of what other kind of primitive collections and relations can look like um, on our uh, toric Fanos. OK, but um, what this allows us to do um, is, is to do the following is we can give a full classification of uh, toric manifolds of um, dimension bigger than or equal to six uh, that have this minimal projective bundle dimension of dimension um, X or N minus two. Um, and so kind of some two key things we're, we're going to use um, is first do uh, to Kleiman. So this is in uh, 88. Um, so there's a, he gives a, a classification of uh, Torek Fano uh, with the card number two. And uh, Batrayev, uh, gives a, a description of smooth uh, torque um, of Picard number um, three. Mm. Um, and this um, description that Batyev gives is all in terms of primitive collections and primitive relations. <clears throat> OK, so using kind of those descriptions, we can now fully classify um, Toric manifolds um, that have this minimal projective bundle dimension large, so um, bigger than or equal to the dimension of X minus two. Okay, um, so let me maybe just just kind of unify uh, what we, we've been talking about so far. Um, so again, um, we have here this first piece that if we have uh, minimum projective bundle dimension N, we have PN. Okay, so again, that first diagonal that we saw on the table, um, if we have minimum projective bundle dimension um, n minus one, then we also only have one uh, such uh, torque Fano, so it's this blow up of Pn along a linear Pn minus two. <clears throat> 
OK, and now if we look at the case uh, where we have minimum projective bundle dimension and minus two. OK, there are going to be exactly eight um, isomorphism classes. OK, and they kind of come in in two different flavors. Um, so this first flavor is when we have um, a, a surface and a particular toric vector bundle. <clears throat> Um, and so let me maybe just mention these first three. Uh, this is when our Picard number is uh, two. Okay, where S here is all a P2 and, and e, um, e is varying. Uh, and then the second three here, where S is either P1 cross P1 or this first Hertzebrook surface, uh, these have uh, Picard number three. Mm -hmm. OK, and then there are kind of two other classes uh, that we get. Um, so these are some various blow ups. These are also coming again from Bateyev's um, description and these uh, other two examples here. Um, they also have Picard number three. <clears throat> OK, so we have this kind of full classification um, of these toric Fano manifolds where the minimum projective bundle dimension is big or, or large. OK, um, and so we know this first one here. This is a projective space, so we know that this one is uh, two Fano. OK, um, in the second case, these are blow up, so these are, are not two Fano. OK, and then if we look at um, these ones that we have with minimum projective bundle dimension and minus two, so again, uh, we can show then that these are also uh, not two Fano. OK, and so um, as a corollary of, the, of this full classification um, and a partial answer to our conjecture, OK, um, we have that the projective space uh, PN. So this is the only smooth uh, n-dimensional torque two Fano manifold uh, that has either um, minimal projective bundle dimension one, um, n minus two, n minus one or n. OK, and so again, just as a reminder of, of what we have now already, here, so we have these m equal one ones. So we know that those are all not two Fano. Um, again, we have this first diagonal. That is the case where we have projective space. So this, these ones are uh, two Fano. Uh, and then we have uh, these cases as well. Um, so those are the blow ups that are, are not two Fano. And then now the last thing that we can add um, in with our um, work so far. So we also have taken care of, of these cases. Uh, so this is where we have uh, the minimal projective bundle dimension of n minus 2. Okay, so we still have kind of these, these middle cases uh, left to do. So on this table, it doesn't look like there's a, a lot, but um, as uh, the dimension of x uh, gets bigger, uh, we still have kind of these middle cases um, that we have not yet dealt with. Um, and so again, kind of our hope is, is that we would be able to address these in a similar fashion um, than what we what we did for that m equals one um, case. All right. Um, and so as I was chatting a little bit before we we started talking, um, so our group um, has uh, been fortunate to meet once in person um, last summer, and we're going to be meeting again um, this summer um, uh, in a few weeks um, to kind of continue to work on on this project. Um, so this was all of us minus one. So Roya. Um, was unable to meet with us last year at the last minute. Um, but here we were actually really using whiteboards, which was nice um, as opposed to uh, working over uh, Zoom, which has been most of our collaboration. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, and I would be happy to answer any questions.